Washington, D.C. is my home away from home. I've worked here for the better part of three decades as a founder entrepreneur, policy expert, and author. Probably the longest title. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity. Merciful, sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. I've learned leadership secrets from many healthcare executives who understand that Washington is the largest payer and regulator of healthcare. She said, well, because you'll never get a husband if you do that. <laughs> I began interviewing healthcare leaders many years ago because what better way to learn how they think, why they make it to the top, and how they remain there. Think about what was your most challenging engagement? Healthcare has been the most difficult problem. <laughs> Let me just say that. We'll talk about that yeah. later. Adam Bryant wrote the corner office column at the New York Times for 10 years. And during that time, he interviewed over 500 CEOs. He's a virtual storehouse of information about how CEOs think about leadership. Although Adam has not studied healthcare, since his two daughters are nurses at Ochsner Health System in New Orleans, we invited Adam into the healthcare family. This conversation with Adam was one leadership lesson after another and drew on his new book, The CEO Test, in fact, there are seven tests, and we covered all of them in this conversation. For example, Adam discusses the question, can you lead transformation? Or can you really listen? Or can you build teams that are true teams? We work through how CEOs think about these questions and more. I ask Adam his view on whether there are natural leaders. You'll be surprised at his answer. We discuss the characteristics of a successful CEO and the importance of handling uncertainty and risk. We wrapped up this thoughtful and engaging conversation by asking Adam for his advice to up and coming leaders. Well, good morning, Adam, and welcome. Thanks so much, Gary. Thanks for having me. We're pleased to have you at this microphone. This show is all about leadership and with the work that you've done uh, in your past as a journalist, you're an acknowledged expert in that space. As I was mentioning earlier, we're claiming you in healthcare because your two daughters work as nurses uh, in emergency rooms. So welcome to the to the healthcare clan. <laughs> Thank Adam. you. Why don't we uh, kick off? It's always fun to explore backgrounds of our guests. What was life like growing up for you, Adam? Uh, so I was born in Montreal, um, and we border hopped every five years sort of between Canada and the United States. So I've got two passports. Um, I always joke I'm bilingual. I speak Canadian and American. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think there were some lessons in having to move once in a while and be able to move into do different groups of people. Um, and, uh, yeah, my, my father was a journalist, and I, I think I, I saw him work and caught you know, kind of the journalism bug from him. So decided I would, when I was in my 20s that I wanted to go into journalism. But, you know, when I was a kid, I was basically one of those kids who couldn't sit still. I was always doing something, played a, a ton of sports, pretty much every sport there there is uh, and enjoyed it um, and was pretty good student in the sense that I was quick study. But uh, again, because I couldn't really sit still, I I sort of figured out the art of, uh, of getting um, you know, to the essence of something pretty quickly, which turned out to be pretty good training for journalism later on. Given the fact that your father was a journalist, was he in any way influential or did your parents participate in your decision to become a journalist? No, never, never pushed it at all. Um, and I think the thing that I got from both my parents, um, my, my father in particular, um, is that he was a, a world champion listener. I would, um, he just had this ability just by listening really closely to people to, um, you know, have these almost like transformative conversations. And I would see him do this over and over just by showing real genuine interest in somebody, get them really animated and telling stories. And um, so, uh, so learned a lot of that from him. We'll talk about listening and leadership a bit later. What got you into thinking about the corner office? Sure, it's, it's a pretty simple story. So um, I was a reporter at the New York Times for 10 years in the 1990s. Um, and I, I, I wanted to go into business journalism, not because I'm particularly interested in, you know, stocks go up, stocks go down, but more that I felt like 
business was a great lens to understand why people do what they do and, and sort of see trends about the broader world. Um, I covered a lot of different companies, a lot of industries, and I interviewed a lot of CEOs and did those interviews in the way that most interviews with CEOs are done, which is essentially to interview them as strategists, right? It's almost like you're a Wall Street analyst, like how does next quarter look and these new products and these industry dynamics and how you're going to win. Um, and that's, that's all well and good, but I just found the more time I spent with CEOs, the more I was intrigued by them simply as people and wanted to set aside those questions and ask them kind of more timeless things like, how did you, how do you do your job and how did you learn to do your job? And, and so all of that kind of ultimately rolled up into me launching this corner office series in 2009. Um, and it was based on, you know, one primary what if question, which is what if I sat down with CEOs and never asked them a single question about their companies uh, and instead just ask them about leadership lessons they've learned over the course of their lives and how they think about culture and hiring and teams and career advice and all these timeless rather than timely questions. Um, and so, you know, that simple what if kind of launched the series. I interviewed 525 CEOs. Um, uh, you know, every week, never missed a week for a decade and uh, wrote a couple of books based on it. And that ultimately set me up for my new chapter of my career now working for the Exco group where we do leadership development and executive mentoring at the senior level. I will say, too, when I launched Corner Office, there was a secondary what if question. Uh, and that was important to me, which is what if I interviewed a lot of women and people of color and never ask them any race or gender specific questions. So in effect, get rid of the adjective that sometimes creeps in in front of the word leader, like female leader or black CEO, things like that. Get rid of those adjectives and just interview everybody the same way. Because um, I just felt, you know, it'd be nice to imagine a day when, you know, if you're a female CEO, you know, just to have an interview that doesn't begin with like, so you're a wife, you're a mother, you're a CEO, how do you do it all? And and even to this day, you know, I see female CEOs being interviewed that way. And and you can see this kind of slow blink in their in their eyes of like, really, are we going to have that conversation again? So tried to try to make that contribution. Well, at what point um, in your 525 interviews did you realize that you were building a library of information about leadership? Yeah, I, I didn't have, um, you know, I, I guess it was more sort of a, a slow dawning of recognition. Uh, you know, when I launched Corner Office, it was just sort of like, let's see what happens. Um, and uh, and I think w what, what happened over time is that there was, you know, this idea of data is usually, you know, quantitative. But at some point I hadn't, I started feeling like I had enough data that was qualitative, that clear patterns were emerging about, you know, what set these leaders apart. Um, and because I always asked open-ended questions, I felt like the data was pretty good. I mean, obviously, you know, you could say I had selection bias in who I was choosing to interview, but clear patterns around leadership started emerging and you know by now i've got like about six million words from the raw transcripts that i've done um and also you know what's so interesting about leadership is like i think it's one of the hardest things to do period like just hardest things in the world because it's just full of paradoxes and complexities and contradictions and you know, the more CEOs I interviewed, the more I realized that everybody has their own approach, right? Like, you know, what works for one person isn't going to work for another. It might depend on whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. But I think the best leaders figure out a way to make it make it work for themselves based on who they are and the people they're leading and the context in which they're leading. So, um, you know, I my brain is wired to always be searching for patterns. And so that's been... You know, that's ultimately what's led to now three books that I've written. So I've always thought the interviewing I've done is collecting primary research. My background's a researcher. And I just think about 525 interviews is a phenomenal amount of uh, content and information. And as you say, ability to pick up trends and so on. It's very impressive. What, what was inter interesting for me doing the interviews every week is that, especially when I started out, I was kind of road testing different questions, right, to see what, you know, ultimately yielded the best stories and insights. Um, and I, 
ultimately settled on this pattern of starting every interview with the same three questions, basically, which is like, tell me when, about when you were a kid, just like you did with me. Um, tell me about your parents, like what did they do or whoever raised you and how did they influence you? And, and the third question was, how have your parents influenced the way you lead today? Uh, and I generally found that, you know, once you got the answers to those three questions, you kind of understood somebody. I mean, and, and people were very open about adversity they faced in earlier in their lives and how, you know, if they had an alcoholic parent, how that influences how they lead today. And I think that level of self-awareness is incredibly important as a leader. Do you think that there's natural leaders, Adam, just like there's natural athletes or natural musicians? I think some people are born with a bit of an aptitude for it, but I also think it it is definitely a muscle that can be developed. And one of the things we really tried to do with this latest book, The CEO Test, is is frame things in terms of like ROI. So this idea that because leadership is about everything at some level, right? And if you want to get better as a leader, we wanted to help answer the question, like if I'm going to spend an hour a week like trying to become a better leader, where, where am I going to get the be- biggest return of investment on that effort? Um, and so that was a, a big part of the goal. Like, so I think a big part of leadership is understanding the things that really matter that are going to you know, impact the teams and build the teams and culture and listening and things like that. Because um, leadership is, you know, it is a kind of puzzling field. I mean, I've come to appreciate the fact that you can say literally anything about leadership and it's going to probably be right at some level. I mean, just if you say fill in the blank, leadership is all about X, you can say it's about anything, right? And you're probably, people are gonna nod their heads and say, yeah, that's right. Um, But to me, you know, just because something isn't wrong doesn't mean it's an insight. And so what I've really focused on in all my work around leadership is like, what's a true insight about how to lead more effectively rather than just repeating kind of a truism or a platitude. The CEO test has seven tests that are articulated, some of which we'll cover today. I found it to be, as you say, really easy to pick up uh, some kind of learning about uh, comparing it to how I view myself and where I should spend my time and energy. I thought it was terrific. By the way, easily readable as well. So I'm a a board member of a company that actually is a large public company that's currently searching for a CEO. How should I think about characteristics, Adam, of uh, a successful CEO? Sure, and and I think some some context is important um, because this is a question that boards are dealing with right now. I mean, we are talking to a lot of directors in our consulting work and heads of HR and CEOs. And just coming out of the pandemic, we hear the same thing from everybody, kind of we are rethinking everything in terms of, you know, what we are looking for in leaders of the past. And the themes that come up most often now are like agility, you know, humanity, right? The the wall between the personal and professional has come down. Um, I also think one of the things, the, the way the, the idea of succession is changing is that for a very long time, Um, companies and consultancies would develop these lists of competencies, right, that they would use for assessments. And it's very easy to get, you know, 50 or even 100 competencies that you would expect and need from an executive, like, you know, strategic mindset and executive presence. Um, But I think there's this dawning recognition that even with all that work, like nothing's really changing. (laughs) And the fact of the matter is the average tenure of CEOs is five years, right? And it's been going down over time. So you have to say like, is something about the system not working as well as it should? And I, I think part of the problem, Gary, is that, you know, the degree to which hope is part of a company's talent strategy is too high because I think what they do is they they'll they'll sort of look at a candidate and say well they've got a lot of the competencies now this is a big new job we're going to put them into and then they cross their fingers under the table and say let's hope they do well right and I think the way you close that gap and reduce the degree to which hope is a talent strategy is being clear about what that job entails if we're putting them into this job what what will be the biggest determinants of whether they succeed or fail in that role? And then once you get clarity around that, 
then you can look at the candidate in a more sort of holistic sense and look for, does this person have a track record in that? Because you can say as a CEO or something, we need somebody who really, you know, for whom diversity is really important. And if you decide that that's really important, then you just look at their track record and all the teams they built in all their jobs were those diverse teams or not. So you get sort of a recognition. So I think it's just getting really clear on what the job entails and then looking for, does this person have a demonstrated track record of doing that? And again, there's thousands of leadership books out there, but one of the contributions we wanted to make was to sort of get clarity around, this is what the actual jobs, job entails. You know, it's not like that sort of hope, like, you know, the evil Knievel motorcycle <laughs> jump across the Gan Grand Canyon. Will they make it or not? It's like, let's, let's close the back gap of that canyon and say, this is what the job is. And if we agree that this is what the job is, does this person have a demonstrated track record of doing this kind of work? One point that was made in a book that I found particularly compelling, and that is the difference between priorities and outcomes. Sometimes it's easy to set your priorities, but forget that you're driving toward outcomes. Can you share some of your thinking about that, Adam? Sure, and, and some of the insights start with our work on leadership teams, because you know when we work with teams, we often ask them, like, what are your priorities? Um, and often we are given lists that are, you know, 12 things long, you know, one of my partners told me that a leadership team handed him a list of priorities that was 182 items long. <laughs> um, and if, first of all, if you believe in the sort of Jim Collins saying that if you have more than three priorities, you don't have priorities, right? So I think the first insight is that most lists of priorities are too long. And I think if you pause and say, well, why is that? And, and one of the reasons is because if you're you know, a leader, you want to sort of demonstrate that you've got your arms around all the challenges, right? Um, another dynamic that kicks in is that if you've got a leadership team of eight people, then it's natural for every one of them to want to get sort of acknowledged that what they're doing is important. So suddenly, if you've got eight people on your leadership team, then there's eight priorities reflecting each of those. And so there's all these traps that people fall into. But the other thing, this idea, um, you know, I, I realized that pr the word priority itself is problematic because it's ambiguous, it's amorphous. Implicit in it is this idea of like, I'm always working on this. And, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm wired to, to sort of spot patterns. And as I've seen more and more lists of priorities, I started noticing how many bullet points start with the same two words. And those two words are continue to. And for me, it's like, okay, if, if that's really a priority and you're saying you're going to continue to do it, well, isn't that something that you always do? And is it really a priority? I mean, as a human being, I need to, you know, sleep and eat and breathe, and but I wouldn't put those on my list of priorities, right? So, um, so shifting the conversation to outcomes, I think, leads to a much more concrete and practical discussion. You know, the simple question of 12 months from now, when we look back, what are the two or three things we need to have accomplished for this to be a good year? And just that conversation has this kind of breakthrough effect on leadership teams like, oh, okay, like, what do we need to achieve rather than stuff we're always going to be working on in perpetuity? Some say being a CEO is a good life, but a lonely life. And you address that in the book. Um, how did that kind of discussion go when you were interviewing CEOs? We A lot of them talked about listening. And I, I think a, a big part of being a leader involves self-awareness and awareness of some of the traps that you can fall into. And one of the traps is this idea of like the higher you go in the organization, the more, you know, messages and data gets massaged and managed, um, you know, before it reaches you. And it was captured in this expression that a woman named Mel, Nell Minow that I, who I interviewed shared with me. And it, the expression is, watch how funny your jokes get. Right. Um, and I've seen that dynamic myself where, you know, the boss tells a joke that's not very funny and everybody's, uh, you know, laughing at them like they're Dave Chappelle or something. And there's a great scene in the in the HBO series, The Sopranos, that captures this dynamic where, you know, Tony is playing 
poker with some friends of his and, and his wife, Carmela, said like, said to him at one point, look, these guys, you know, they're not your friends. They work for you. You know, they laugh at your stupid joke. So he intentionally tells a stupid joke, right? Just to see the reaction. And of course, these guys like burst out laughing and there's this kind of slow pan of the camera. Um, and so, you know, the first part is recognizing that you are trapped in a bubble. Um, and the second part of that is saying, okay, if I am trapped in a bubble, what am I going to do to break out of it? Um, because so many companies fall into really big trouble because the leader may give off signals either, you know, explicit or, or, or you know, just through their body language that they don't want to hear bad news and they don't want people to disagree with them. So, you know, there's always bad news in a company, right? So, you know, is it going to get to the top? Um, and so to me, those are like, the, the, the key lessons, and it was really brought to life by my co-author, Kevin Scher, who's a former CEO of, of Amgen, and he tells this story of how, you know, he's the first to acknowledge when he was a younger uh, executive, he was a terrible listener. Um, he said a lot of questions would just go like, you know, it's going to take me five minutes to show, you know, for me to show you that I'm smarter than you, I'm going to tell you what you're going to tell me, Gary, and then I'm going to tell you what to do because it's going to be very efficient. Um, and it worked for him for a long time, but then Amgen had this horrible crisis with regulators and a particular drug. And Kevin had this epiphany where he was sitting by himself waiting for his daughter to show up for dinner. And he just sort of said, look, what do I need to own for this problem? You know, wh what did I do or not do? And he realized like I was a horrible listener. And from that moment on, he just became a much better listener, created this kind of ecosystem or infrastructure so that he really knew what was going on inside his organization, what regulators were thinking. Um, as part of the employee uh, annual employee service he, survey, he had this open field question where he would ask everybody in the company, what do you think of the job that Kevin is doing? Um, and get sort of unvarnished feedback. So, you know, I, I really think that listening is kind of the leadership superpower, and I think it's underappreciated. Um, I, I would be surprised if I found a business school that had how to be a le better listener as part of its curriculum, but um, it should be. It should be, and having graduated from the Wharton Business School, it was not on the, uh, on the agenda there, not part of the curriculum. Uh, but I, it, it strikes me that a lot of us think we're good listeners, but probably aren't, much like Kevin perhaps. Could you tell when you were interviewing these CEOs, could you kind of pick up who was the better listener or who wasn't? Yeah, it, a lot of it just on their end was just whether they were actually answering my questions, right? Because some people would sort of sit down with these predetermined talk tracks in their head and, you know, it's almost like a politician with a talking point. It doesn't matter what you ask them. Um, and, you know, I did a lot of work up front to make sure, you know, I. I once I started Corner Office, it was soon after I created it, I was getting, a, you know, probably eight pitches every single day from companies saying, please interview our CEO. So I was kind of like a, you know, bouncer at a club. I could determine who got in and um, did a lot of work up front to make sure that they were the kind of person who was going to answer my questions. Um, but, it, you know, all those interviews, it, I have thought a lot about listening and for me, as much as I was focused on like, are they listening to me? It was a, it was a real kind of weekly um, test for me on being a good listener because when these CEOs would sit down with me, I did probably ninety nine percent of them in person rather than over the phone. Um, you know, my job was to get them to trust, get them to trust me and and open up to me and share with me stories that maybe they hadn't shared before. Um, and I think part of that is like you know, do you seem trustworthy? But I think a big part of it is that people can tell if you're listening to them. And I think you can see it in their eyes. I mean, I always say that eye contact is the 5G of communication. You can tell if somebody's distracted. Um, and for me, you know, it was probably the closest I've, I ever come to meditating in so far as I try to be super present during all my interviews. And not think about the meeting I just came from or the meeting I have to go to or some tough deadline I'm facing three hours from now. Because I just learned over time that if I started getting distracted, it had this kind of butterfly effect on the interview. And like in some subtle way, I could tell the person was pulling back a little bit. 
Um, so it was just this great discipline for me week after week of like, you know, just you have to be present. Um, because if you really are, it, it is so rare these days that uh, it can lead to some in, incredible moments. I don't know if you could tell this by the interviews, probably not, but I've noticed uh, some people have the capacity to act like they're listening. They seem attentive and, you know, take notes and whatnot, but then they don't actually go implement <laughs> what, you know, what we're talking about. Have, have you run into that in your career? Yeah, I have. And, and I do think, you know, I, I heard this great expression that a lot of conversations are just serial monologues where, you know, somebody is talking and the other person is not listening. They're just waiting for, you know, for you to stop talking. And but the question is, like, what is your goal when you're listening? Are you really listening for understanding, for comprehension, to learn something that maybe you didn't know? Um, you know, I'll, I'll confess that I'm a pretty hardcore introvert and I don't you know, particularly like to go to a lot of parties, but I always feel like when I do go to parties, I want to wear a big button that says, do you want an audience or do you want a conversation? Because <laughs> a lot of people don't want to have a conversation. Right. They just want to have an audience, right? right? And yep. I'm a pretty good listener, so I can be a pretty good audience and ask them questions all night. I'm always so shocked if somebody starts asking me questions because for the most part, they never do. Let's go back to teams for a moment. The term in the book is true teams and i wondered what you meant by true teams sure and and i think it starts with um this insight and and your listeners and viewers will have to agree with me or not on this upfront kind of threshold insight which is do you think that the phrase dysfunctional family is redundant <laughs> Right. Because I think most families are dysfunctional at some level. Right. So if you if you agree with me on that point, then there's a following logic that comes from that, which is that if every family is dysfunctional, then putting a bunch of strangers around the table is not by definition going to make them a high performing team, even if you want them to be. And the idea is that I, I think left to their own devices like teams, you put high performing, high achieving, ambitious people on a leadership team together where they are fighting for both resources and attention. You're naturally going to get, you know, a zero sum culture. I mean, I always make the joke that there's a reason why HBO ran Game of Thrones on Sunday night, which is to get people ready for work the next day, right? Because that's how a lot of leadership teams operate. You know, I've got to take you down if I'm going to succeed. And so left to their own devices, I think that's how, you know, even though every leadership team says the same thing when, when you meet with them, they all say, we want to have each other's back, right? We want to trust. Everybody wants that. But again, when you're fighting for resources and attention and all those other things, the Game of Thrones dynamics kick in. So you just have to have a really explicit counterweight that starts at the top. And the leader has to be much super intentional about it and have those kind of meta discussions about how we're going to operate as a team to provide that kind of clear counterweight to all those instincts that kick in. Um, and I've seen too many leaders who are a little bit passive. There are some leaders who actually like, they say they call it creative tension. So they like watching the whole Game of Thrones things operate. Um, some leaders have this kind of hands-off uh, attitude. They, they sort of scratch their head and say, why doesn't my leadership team get along? not realizing that they are the ones that's, that are setting the tone. So what we tried to do in the book is really create this framework. If you're a leader with a leadership team, it's like be clear on these four questions because otherwise you're just going to get Game of Thrones. Another observation in the book that somebody said that really good companies only have about 75% of, the, of their people at the right job at the right time and so on, and that poor companies have probably 25% of the people in the right job. Um, do you subscribe to that? Yeah, I was, I, when I heard that from Greg uh, Brenneman, who, by the way, was the very first CEO I interviewed for Corner Office, I mean, it was a pretty stark observation on, on his part, right? Um, but I, you know, you may quibble with the numbers, uh, the exact percentages, but I think the insight is important because, you know, I, I think at a lot of companies, there's not that sort of clarity on what is expected of the person in the role and accountability. I mean, a lot of people go out of their way uh, to avoid having tough conversations, to deliver bad performance reviews. And 
some cultures, you know, take literally this idea, well, we're a family here, right? You hear that from a lot of companies. And the danger of that is that, you know, like in true families, you can't fire your Uncle Joe. And, you know, if we're a family, then you have to put up with Uncle Joe's weird behavior at the Thanksgiving table, right? And so that kind of mindset is like, well, you know, people are weird and this person isn't really doing their job. So we'll take their job, we'll leave them in their job, but we'll get three other people to do a part of their job. That just kind of dynamic kicks in. Um, and that's why you just have to be, it, you know, to me, it all starts with, uh, with getting the strategy right. And because to me, that's the cornerstone of the foundation. And once you're clear on what you want to achieve and how you're going to get there and the challenges that have to be overcome and the scoreboard, then that will sort of cascade or flow through the rest of the organization. Because otherwise, you know, I, I think at too many companies, the strategy is kind of mushy, which makes it hard for everybody to hold people accountable. And the other thing that happens is human nature kicks in because if the overall strategy is mushy, then people say, well, I'm just going to determine for myself how I'm going to contribute to this company. So basically, you've got people going off in a whole bunch of different directions. Another one of the seven uh, tests in the book, the CEO test, is transformation. And of course, that warms the heart of any healthcare <laughs> leader because we think that we've uh, been in transforming situation for years. That's just part of the job. You read the book and you get the feeling that that's happening probably in most industries these days. Uh, is that what you picked up in your interviews? Yeah, and I think everything has been accelerated just since the pandemic started. I mean, I, I, to me, part of the step back is that we have to acknowledge there's, you know, three big kind of tsunamis rolling across corporations right now. You know, one is sort of the nature of work itself, right? You know, hybrid, remote, just the how work is being done. Um, to me, the second one is the role of companies in society. Um, and not just because of sort of the racial injustice of, of, you know, that coming to the fore last year. But I think we are in this moment where, you know, it's stakeholder capitalism, not shareholder capitalism. Employees increasingly feel like they should have a voice and a vote in the company's policies. Um, and then the third thing is the sort of leadership itself um, and, you know, what's expected of leaders and, you know, the idea of command and control leadership, I think that era is officially dead, right? So I, I think, you know, and then you layer on top of that, I mean, everybody's made the point that it's like five years of digital acceleration to have happened in a matter of months. So it has been a transformative time. And I think all companies are doing that. And the problem, you know, the big challenge if for anybody who's in a leadership position is just that, you know, most people don't like change right? Like some people love it and they love the ambiguity and the uncertainty and the gray areas and all that. And they really lean into it. But most people don't like change because it, you know, uncertainty means risk. And, you know, people like to sort of go into work and have a sense of stability. Um, and so the, the challenge then for leaders is how do you get people to be open to that? Because otherwise, just, people are just going to freeze and not do anything. So how do you get them to actually want to help with their transformation? And I think, uh, you know, there's a few key parts of the playbook is being really clear on the simple, like, this is the state of, of our company in the world today. And these are the th these are the reasons why we have to change. And also then paint a picture of like, this is what we will look like when we change. And just to create a very simple picture that nobody can argue with, right? Based on data, like here are the trend lines. You know, we, we show the New York Times as, an, as a, one of the case studies in the book. And, you know, print advertising, which was the mothership of, rev, re, mothership of revenue, was going down like this. And so status quo was not an option. They had to change. So I think that's the first thing that you have to do. You know, clarity about, like, this is the world today. Status quo isn't an option. And this is where we need to get to. And then I think another important insight that I heard from some leaders is just framing up the conversation in terms of let's be clear about what is not going to change. Fundamental, whether it's values or mission or purpose and what we stand for and the contribution, if you say that is not going to change, mission, tradition, or mission is not going to change, but maybe traditions are, like the processes and how we get there. 
just setting up that framework, I think, makes people a little more open to uh, to being up for that. And I, I think the final point I'll make is that, you know, if you imagine a leader on a stage sort of setting out the case for transformation, that inevitably somebody's going to put up their hand and they go, well, how do we know this is going to work? Right. And, and I do think that's one of those one of those CEO tests. And, and I think a simple monologue that I've heard from some of the leaders I've talked to is like, look, just be honest. We I cannot be certain that 100 percent that this is going to work. I can only be like 70 percent certain that this is going to work. But what I need is everybody to be 100 percent committed to making this work. And if the world changes or if our theory changes, we'll let people know and we'll adjust. But just having those simple frameworks so that people go, OK, I can sign up for this. Do you think CEOs have a greater capacity for uh, dealing with uncertainty and risk than other leaders? I think they need to, whether all of them do. You know, if you ask yourselves, like, why do people succeed or fail in these roles? And um, so I think some anybody who goes into, you know, a big leadership job with a, a rigid view of, of their theory of how, you know, the company should work and how the world should work and what's not what's not going to change. I don't think they're going to last long in those roles. But um, look, I, I think being a CEO, being an effective leader is just a whole almost infinite series of balancing acts. And to be able to, you know, in the last chapter, we talk about the paradoxes of leadership. And I think that's, I think it's an important insight because you can't go into leadership with a, you know, is it this or that? Because it's never this or that, it's this and that. And it's like, what is the moment demand? And so I just, and, and I think the way that plays out, you know, I, I think if you ask yourself, like, what is it about the way a CEO's brain works or needs to work? And, you know, we've heard like these big sort of labels about agility and curiosity and all that. But when I think of how a leader's, an effective leader's brain works. Um, I think of it as like one part is sort of this kind of periscope or radar that's like constantly scanning the horizon, you know, and it's a broad horizon, like new information, what's going on in our industry, like think of healthcare, what's going on in healthcare, what's, you know, what's Amazon doing, what, what can we learn from all these other industries what are the macroeconomic forces? just this kind of sense of like always scanning the horizon taking that data and then kind of building you know to me the core skill of leadership we talked about in the first chapter is simplifying complexity so then taking all that data developing a model a sort of theory of the case of how our company is going to succeed in the world now and in five years so you build that model that you can then communicate in an all hands meeting and keep it simple, right? And then, so it's that sort of, and then constantly testing those back and forth. So you build the model, the theory of how, you know, the company works and how it's gonna win in the world. And then it's this constant back and forth. It's like always scanning the horizon for new information that might make you tweak that model. And so to me, like, if you go inside an, an effective CEO's brain, that's what it looks like to me. Another one of the tests, one of the seven tests, is handling a crisis. How did you, how did you kind of dig into that during your CEO interviews to figure out how they would approach a crisis? It was the toughest chapter to write in the sense that we were, we were writing the book in the middle of the pandemic, right? And so it, was, it was the last chapter we uh, sent in to the editor, and it probably took us about three months to write. But... I think an important part whenever you talk about crisis is, you know, a simple framework and say, look, at the end of the day, there's two kinds of crises. One is something like the pandemic that affects everybody, right? You think of the financial crisis of 2008, the sense of we're all in this together. And the other type of crisis is something that happens like in your sandbox, whatever that sandbox is, right? The company you're running, the team you're running, and you're the leader, and this is a reflection of like you and your reputation. So I, I think, you know, to have a fruitful discussion of now about navigating a crisis, you need to sort of set up that framework. And, and I've been really intrigued, been doing a lot of interviews um, with leaders about, you know, what are the leadership lessons they've learned during this pandemic, literally in real time? How are they thinking about navigating a crisis? And I think there's fascinating insights there. To me, the main one 
is that when you're in a crisis like that, that you see it as an opportunity. You just have that mindset of like rip off the rear view mirror. We're not talking about going back to normal. What is the opportunity here to help us like rethink how we do our business to try different things, to maybe get some, you know, take care of some momentum killers that we had in the past to experiment. There have been so many silver linings through this tragedy. You know, I've heard so many leaders talk about, you know, God, the muscles that we build, that kind of speed of innovation. I hope we can keep, you know, hold on to that as we get on the other side of this, because, you know, there, there is that phenomenon. Again, a lot of it's just human nature. Like I've always felt that if you give enough people enough time sitting around the table, they're going to come up with reasons not to do something. Right. And that whole dynamic went away during the crisis because, you know, when the pandemic hit, it's like we need to get everybody working at home in three days, like right now. And so there's no time to think about why it can't be done. And so, like, again, so many lessons around that. You shift to the other one of, like, if a crisis happens on your watch, to me, there's a couple of key insights. One is to just, you know, recognize that most leaders go into denial, like, this can't be happening to me. The world doesn't understand. We're all well-intended, hardworking people. How can this be happening? And so a big part of it is recognizing that every word that comes out of your mouth is going to be a test of your credibility. And so you simply cannot say anything that you're going to regret later and say things that you don't know to be true. And, and the history books are just filled with this lesson over and over. We talked to this guy, Tom Strickland. He's a partner at Wilmer Hale. He advises a lot of big companies on crises. And he says, this is the, this is the core lesson that people forget over and over is like, don't say anything you don't know, because what happens is like, if there's a, a you know, cyber attack and there's a breach of customers, credit card information, and it's like 10 million people were affected. It's like, that's it. You know, it's only 10 million. We've got it on top of this. And then a week later, it's like, well, it turned out to be 40 million. And then two weeks later, it's like, it's actually 110 million. And then your, your credibility is shot and you can't get that back. That's true. You know, one of the things I've, as I've been talking to the healthcare CEOs, healthcare leaders, um, one of the things that they say they took away from this crisis is humbleness. And the reason is because they were forced to make decisions. There was so little data available at the beginning, particularly, or the data that was available were wrong, kind of your point, uh, that they were constantly in a situation of having to say, look, we're going to make a decision based on the data that we have might change. Well, sure enough, it did change. So there was this series of uh, back and forth and that they took away that they just needed to be more humble in terms of how they approached uh, approached their employees. Yeah. And, and it's, I think a big part of that is just being secure enough to be able to say, I don't know, what does everybody else think? Right. Because it, you know, my point earlier that I think the era of command and control leadership is dead. It is over because I think anybody who sits at the head of a table right now and says they know exactly what's going to happen um, is going to lose credibility. So it's just that simple thing of and and recognize. I, I love this expression about teams, um, you know, that the smartest person in the room is the room. It's just this idea of like collectively we'll come up with the right answer together um, and uh but again, that, that takes a level of, of confidence and being grounded and security as a leader to be able to say, I don't know, what does everybody else think? And also say like, I don't know, but I am confident we'll figure this out, but I don't know the answer right now. The last chapter in the book is managing the inner game of leadership. And I was curious as to why you, uh, you use the word game it, it's a good question, Gary. I mean, it's it's not a game in a little literal sense, but I, I think, you know, it, maybe it has some of the dynamics of a game in the sense that um, it is challenging. And uh, but it's not something you win necessarily, but you do get better at it. Um, so, you know, your edit is well taken. I guess it could have been called other things. But, uh, you know, a, a big part of the insight for me was in our you know, the mentoring work that we do with new leaders and a lot of, you know, when you move in a leadership position for the first time, it's just overwhelming, right? You're under so much scrutiny. You're trying to figure this out. Um, and, 
you know, if you start looking for advice on how to be a better leader, the more you read, the more you just get all this sort of contradictory information, right? Like for every leader that I've interviewed over the years who said to me, you know, I lead from the back, you know, I've heard just as many say I lead from the front. And, you know, if you really start thinking about it, it's like, I sh you know, you have to create a sense of urgency, but you have to be patient and you need to be compassionate, but you really need to hold people accountable and have tough conversations. And you just go through the list. And, and I think um, what we tried to do in that chapter is help create some frameworks and kind of settle down the noise and understand like this is how you need to be as a leader. The first six chapters of the book are what you need to do. Like this is the job, what you have to do as a leader. And I thought there was an interesting, you know, framing for the last one. It's like, how do you need to be? And it was, goes back to what I was talking about, the paradoxes earlier. It's like once you understand that all that conflicting advice, they're not conflicts. It's just understanding what the balance point is. Because to me, you know, I, I mentioned this whole idea of eye contact and I interviewed, you know, the vast majority of the people I've interviewed in person. And I was struck by this quality that so many of, of them had. They did seem to be calm and confident um, and credible. And I, sp I spent a lot of time sort of reflecting on why that is. Because being, you know, a CEO, it's a tough job. Like every 30 seconds, you're getting barraged from some different angles, some new challenge. And so how do you stay calm and confident within that? And I think a big part of it is coming up with sort of a framework, not only for like the strategy for the company, but also coming up with a framework that works for yourself for leadership. And it starts with understanding what's important to you and what your belief system is on how to build a high performing culture and as a team and how to deal with people and all those things and just sort of coming to those sort of ballot points. And some people need different things and some situations need different things. But to understand at least what your kind of theory of the case is, and then you can flex as need be. And to me, that's a big part of why effective leaders do look calm and confident. Um, and so we want to, to sort of share the best advice that we could and, and you know, experiences that Kevin has lived himself to help people achieve that sense and, and, and not feel overwhelmed. And at the end of the day, Gary, I, I will also say, I mean, you know, part of the contribution we wanted to make is just to help leaders become better because there's just, there's too many bad bosses out there, right? You know, I, I think we're moving into this era where bad bosses are on alert a little bit and are going to get called out by their employees um, more than they have in the past, but there's still too many bad bosses. And you know, people don't wake up in the morning and say, I, I want to be a bad boss, right? They don't do that. But then you ask yourself, well, why are there so many bad bosses? And I, I think part of it is that they, they do, you know, they sort of have this rigid approach of like, this is my leadership style and all my employees need to accommodate my style. And, you know, this is my approach for driving success and, and they sort of ex expect the world to accommodate their worldview and it doesn't work that way. Um, and so when it doesn't work, they get frustrated and they sort of double down and start pounding the table. And so just sort of stepping back and saying, like, how do, like, how do you need to be as a leader? And, you know, so much of it, again, is just about finding the balance point in all these paradoxes. Well, I hope that all these bad bosses read the CEO test because they will become better. Adam, this has been a terrific interview. We very much appreciate your time. I'd like to ask one final question, if I could. A number of our uh, audience are up and coming leaders, and I'm sure you're asked all the time for advice by people that are in that up and coming uh, class, but what advice would you give for up and coming leaders? I, I do go back to this core skill of simplifying complexity. And, you know, the, one of the questions I've asked myself is if I've, you know, interviewed hundreds of leaders, what is it about them? And they come from such diverse backgrounds and different paths. Like what, what is kind of the through line? And, and I do think it is this habit of mind that they can simplify complexity so they can take all the complexity of their industry and the strategy and all that and be and can articulate it and communicate it in a simple way to get people to understand and follow. And so my advice to aspiring leaders is to 
you know, not only build that muscle for yourself. So if you're writing a memo, how can it be shorter, more concise? If you're building a PowerPoint deck, how can you use fewer slides to always be doing that, building that muscle for yourself, but also to be watching other people. You know, when you're watching other leaders and watch them through the lens of, you know, who does this well? You know, what what do they do that helps them do it well? Who doesn't do it well? And to me, it's like a, it's a it's an, a really effective lens for looking at the world and also becoming a better leader yourself. Adam, thanks again. Just a terrific interview, and uh, I love the book that you and uh, Kevin wrote. And uh, for all the viewers and listeners, it's a good one. Good. We really appreciate it, Gary. Thanks for the conversation. Mm-hmm.